Tonight I want to speak on the subject of what was Paul's thorn in the flesh. And uh, I made an executive uh, decision uh, prior to coming to church less than an hour ago that uh, for sake of time I'm only going to walk into one subject and, and do my best to clarify it. And I'm reading tonight out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning to read at verse 6, reading down through verse 10, the words of the Apostle Paul, his second letter to the church at Corinth, he said, if I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so, because I would be telling the truth, but I won't do it, because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Pause right there. Ministries don't have to do a lot of publicizing. And I think if we're not careful in this day and age of social media, we can cross a line where there's too many human fingerprints in social media and not enough direction and spotlight being cast on who we owe it all to. Whatever is in real ministry should be able to be witnessed by what comes out of their mouth. And Paul said, what they see in my life. What comes out of a mighty minister's life should also be seen in how he lives for Christ. Those two should walk hand in hand. And so when I know of ministries, and I'm not mentioning anyone tonight, but when I know of ministries tonight that people are enamored with them because of their gifts of speaking or singing or preaching or prophesying or whatever it may be, and I know that you can't see the fruit of it in their life, I always wonder if they had ever read Paul's second letter where he said, I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud. Pause right there. How many of you know that God said, I hate pride? Very few things in the Bible that are translated into the English language, the word hate, but of the few things in the Bible that are properly rendered from the original manuscripts, the word hate, one of them is God said, I hate pride. You know the greatest way that you can evaluate the genuineness of real ministry, real anointing? Real ministry, real anointing, people that walk with God, will always wear a heavy robe of humility. And when there is an absence of humility, then you can rest assured that something is off track. It is impossible to spend time on your knees in the course of a day in the presence of prayer and in the presence of a holy God and get up off of your knees and boast about anything you do. Anything that we do, we owe it all to Jesus. Anything that God accomplishes should always be immediately given to Jesus. Before Queen Elizabeth died, she made the statement, I wish that I would be alive when Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, returns because I have often thought how wonderful it would be to take the crown off of my head and lay it at the feet of Jesus. To keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, 
My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we have opened up the sacred word of the living God, this is not just a book. It is a living, functioning, holy, miraculous document. For it is the very word of God given to us as a wonderful gift. I humble my heart in your holy presence and before all who listen, and I ask that by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you will lead us and guide us into all truth. I pray especially for every person within the sound of my voice that is not ready to meet the Lord. Should you come tonight, they have concerns that they'd not be ready. Some know they're not ready. Some know they've wandered away. Some know they're living in sin. And I pray that tonight the love of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit would tug at their heart so that when the invitation is given, that by that same Holy Spirit you'll do what no preacher can do, what no sermon can do, what no exegesis can do. By the Holy Spirit, draw people to Jesus Christ and give them faith and courage to say yes when you call. I pray for every person within the sound of my voice who's battling sickness, disease, and infirmity. I release the fire of God even as I'm preaching that heals. The Bible said you sent your word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. So even as I'm preaching, let signs and wonders and miracles begin to take place in those who need the most. I pray for those who are watching online that the same anointing of the Lord that is present here that they could sense there. And if they need Christ, I pray that tonight would be their hour of decision. And for all things, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I always like to tell people right up front where we're going because I think it helps you to process the Bible if you know where we're starting and where we're going. So tonight I'm just going to do my best to simply answer five biblical questions. Number one, where did Paul's thorn in the flesh come from? So if you're taking notes, let me give you the skeletal system to this and then we'll put flesh and bone on it as we move forward. Number one, where did Paul's thorn in the flesh come from? Number two, why was Paul given a thorn in the flesh? Three, what was the purpose of Paul's thorn in the flesh? Number four, what Paul's thorn in the flesh was not? And number five, what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Those simple and often asked questions need good biblical answers. Why? Now, a lot of people might consider the subject of Paul's thorn in the flesh New Testament trivia, but it is not. It is a weighty matter upon which the doctrine of healing has oftentimes been assaulted. And the reason why this message is so vitally important to you as a believer is because if you don't thoroughly understand what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, you will never have the anointing nor the authority to know where to go when you need the power of healing to manifest in your own life or even in ministering to your children or to family these questions are not New Testament trivia. 
They are of great weight to your physical health. And I can't think of a single passage in the entire New Testament that has been more misused, misunderstood, and mistaught when it comes to the doctrine of divine healing than the message of what was Paul's thorn in the flesh. Many misleading sermons, many spurious statements have led people to question what they should believe about their own health and healing. For example, I heard a preacher, well known, not long ago say, if God did not heal the Apostle Paul from his thorn in the flesh, then how can I demand that God heal me? Well, what a terrible statement to put into the hearts of your congregation that God is in limbo and really wavers to and fro upon a subject that proper teaching and preaching shows us that God is unbending it. I've even heard ministers say, well, you know, sometimes we've been guilty of praying for our health and our healing when perhaps God really wanted us, like the Apostle Paul, to endure and ask for grace. And many people have been taught that God uses sickness and disease and infirmity to strengthen our life or to strengthen our Christian character. But when you study the Bible, don't miss this, you have to remember how many of you know that everything has to answer to the proper interpretation of the holy text. And Hebrews 1 and 3 in the New Living Translation says, everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. That's heavy. Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. So the more you learn about Jesus, that's why if you're a brand new believer, I always in our ministry encourage people to begin reading. If you're reading the Bible for the first time, start in the Gospel of John because it's a great book that helps you understand Jesus. And then go to the other Gospels, Matthew and Mark and Luke, and read the Gospels through over and over and over because the more you learn about Jesus, His will, His ministry, His responses, His words, His teaching, then the more you will understand the will of God. Why? Hebrews 1.3. Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. So if Jesus was the perfect will of God on living display when he walked in ministry upon this earth and then we have it authenticated in the scriptures, then you have to ask yourself in all doctrine, how did Jesus teach this? How did Jesus live this? How did Jesus respond to this? So let me just give you a few things. I'm not going to take much time on it. When you get an opportunity, go to our YouTube or our podcast channel and listen to a message entitled Questions on Divine Healing where I spend a lot of time on what I'm going to give you in a thumbnail. Question one, was Jesus ever sick? We have no record of Jesus ever being sick. Now, I've talked to many scholars and theologians and seminarians and Bible college PhDs and we've sat at tables and in luncheons and they've asked me questions about this and they say, well, Tiff, the Bible does say, you know, that the life of Jesus could not be contained in volumes of books that have not been written. The Bible is not an exhaustive of everything Jesus ever said or did or what went on in his life. And I say, well, of course I understand that the Bible doesn't give us every waking moment of Jesus' life and every word that came out of his mouth. But if you have a Ph.D. in theology, are you telling me that we can build doctrine and dogma upon what the Bible doesn't say? You can't build doctrine on what the Bible doesn't say you can only build doctrine to stand upon based upon what the Bible does say. And it's not like God got done writing the Bible and one day later said, oops, 
I wish I had included this. Or, oh my goodness, what was I thinking when I didn't tell this? Everything you need to get you from where you're at to where God wants you to be is contained in the pages of the Bible. It is complete. It is whole. It is perfect. It is without error. It is the living, breathing, powerful word of the living God. We have no record of Jesus ever being sick. We have no record of the disciples ever being sick once they begin to walk in close fellowship with Christ. Did Jesus ever tell anybody their sickness was sent from God? Not one time. Did Jesus ever tell anybody their sickness was sent by God to strengthen their faith? Not one single time. Well, Brother Shuttlesworth, I went through the valley of the shadow of death, and when I came out the other side, God had enriched my life with the newness of faith, and I thank God that he struck me down to teach me these lessons. He didn't strike you down to teach you nothing. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, Jesus died for real sickness and real disease. He didn't die for imaginary sickness. He didn't die for imaginary disease. He didn't die for imaginary suffering. He died for real sickness, real disease, real infirmity. I'm not saying that we don't ever face the attack of the enemy. The Bible tells us, warns us, the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. And there's probably not one single believer who served the Lord for more than a week who hasn't had some type of temptation, some type of attack, some type of physical battle, mental battle, marital ba battle, financial battle, on and on and on. But I am here to tell you, Jesus said in this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. We live in a fallen world. We live in a wicked world. We live in a sinful world. And the curse of sin is all around us. And if you're not careful, you can rub up a little too close to stuff. And it'll get on you and you'll have to get to the altar and say, Lord, cleanse me. Wash me. Make me pure. Get me whole. Get me clean. Help me to know to go where I ought to go. Say what I ought to say. Be what I ought to be. See what I should see and not do the things I I should come on let me hear a good amen. amen Jesus was never sick he never made anybody sick he never told anybody their sickness was sent from God to strengthen their faith and he never refused to heal anybody who came to him in faith believing well then brother Shuttlesworth how do you explain that godly people sometimes die of sickness and disease I don't have to explain that I only have to explain this. I don't have all the answers. I'm not standing up here trying to be the Wizard of Oz. Where in this book does it say that I'm perfect? Where in this book does it say you're perfect? Where in the Bible does it say we'll have all knowledge here this side of glory? Last time I read it, it said on this earth we look through a glass dimly or dully or darkly, but on the other side we'll have full understanding. I don't know why, but I don't, know, don't miss this. I never allow anything on this earth to compare itself to the integrity of the Bible. And the moment you take a question mark, or a problem or a situation that's beyond your intellect or beyond your spiritual discernment and you hold it up as co-equal to the Bible, you have made a tremendous error. You need to go back and get Old Testament faith before you can have New Testament faith. Even Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You never allow anything to be held in co-equality, the integrity of the Bible. I don't know why I buried my first grandson, but I had to bury my first grandson. I've got questions like you've got questions, but I tuck those questions under the blood of Jesus, and I keep this book held high as my compass through all wilderness journeys. 
And I've found that he leads me through every single time. He'll do the same for you. Number one, where did Paul's thorn in the flesh come from? Well, the wonderful thing about this message is the Bible answers every question very clearly. 2 Corinthians 12 and 7. In the New King James Version, Paul said, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Paul himself gives clear testimonial to where this thorn in the flesh came from. He said, it was given to me from Satan, a messenger from Satan. So you cannot in any proper teaching of this text ever put the blame on God. Now, it's a deep subject. I don't have time to discuss it tonight, but let me just throw it out there for the thinkers. There is a world of difference between what God does and what God allows. There is a world of theological difference between what God does and what God allows. That would be a great study for our channels. I promise I'll address it in the days to come. Because when people begin to confuse what God does with what God allows, that also will put question marks on your battleground. And you can't win victories when you're walking on battlefields covered with question marks. They're like mines. They will take you out sooner or later. You've got to settle your doubts. You've got to settle your fears. You've got to put on the whole armor of God and rise above this stuff. And it's the sword of the Spirit that leads us from victory to victory. Now, again, as I've taught you through close to 20 years, you can never take text and just look at text up and close and forget context. All text must be understood in context, and all context must be understood in the full narrative of the book. That's why people get into bad doctrine. They go to these churches where the pastors don't study, don't read, don't further themselves, don't strive before God to become workmans that needeth not to be ashamed. They spend Saturday night scanning through the internet, copying and pasting some little devotional from some little weak site written by somebody who's never been to a seminary and doesn't know the Bible from the Book of Mormon, and they stand up on Sunday morning with an empty theology and an empty head and an empty heart and an empty passion. And they start saying something, well, my pastor's such a good man, such a good man. You know, you can be a good person and be an idiot. It's all right if I love you enough to tell you the truth. There's no excuse. And I know this is going to sound hard. There is no excuse in the 21st century for lazy intellectual ministry. It's one thing back in the day when there were no books available and people were out in the middle of the rural nowheres and had to ride horses for three days to get butter and salt and bacon and beans. And today, you can access the libraries of the world from your phone, from your digital tablets, from your technologies in your house. No preacher living in the 21st century will ever stand before God and make an excuse as to why their Sunday morning pulpit was so shallow. Because the Bible was pretty clear prior to technology being available. Study. Study. To show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So that's what we're doing here. That's why you always hear me say we need to start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. And when I hear a ministry read about a seven-word passage or a short little verse, and then they launch into 40 minutes of their personal commentary and stories and analogies from CNN and ESPN. And they wonder why they've got 50 people after 50 years. Thank you for all those amens. 
The word messenger is the Greek word angelos. I don't expect you to understand Greek, but again, we always go back to original text if we're going to dissect and exegete the Word of God properly. And it's a word that can describe, oftentimes does, an angel. Oftentimes a messenger. And it is always used from the Greek in the context of a messenger or an angel sent on an assignment. One translation uses the word assassin. An assassin was sent to hinder me. A messenger on demonic assignment was sent to try to defeat me. And if this thorn in the flesh had come from God, he would have directly said, a messenger, an angelos, sent from God. But he didn't. He said it was an angelos, a messenger, an angel, an assassin sent from Satan. So there is no debate there. Anybody that debates that is going to have to do theological gymnastics and pervert the text because there is no other meaning available from the text in context. Paul's thorn did not come from God. It came as a messenger sent from Satan. Number two, why was Paul given a thorn in the flesh? He told us. 2 Corinthians 12 and 7, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan, to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Now far be it from me to make any judgments on the Apostle Paul. But by his own admission, he struggled with pride and had a right to. Because Paul... And this is not my opinion. This is backed up by scholarship and historic record and even by non-Christians. Paul may have been one of the most educated minds on the planet at that time. The depth of his education came from multiple cultures. His citizenship, his record. Paul was a brilliant academic. And sometimes people that have unusually unnatural giftings and their giftings cause them to stand head and shoulders above normalcy. Sometimes those people, because that gift is shrouded in human flesh, if they're not careful, they can wrestle with pride. Because the smarter you become in the things of God, the less tolerance you're going to have for ignorance. That's a normal spiritual response. It's not flesh. It's not carnality. The closer you get to God, the more repulsed you'll be by things that are far from God. Paul had been taken into the third heaven and given revelations that were so miraculously deep that God gave him strict orders not to even share it with one human being when he returned to his body on this earth. So first of all, you have to understand the credentials of Paul. Paul wasn't like the other apostles. Paul was head and shoulders, spiritually, intellectually, academically, educationally, experientially, politically, above all of them. And that's why God used him to write almost a third of the New Testament. I mean, think about it. Now you know why God went out of his way to knock this guy off his horse. God was looking for a good pen. And Paul had a deep inkwell that God needed to help you and to help me and to help the Christian church. Can I hear a good amen? Amen. So Satan recognized that. And Satan knows what all your weaknesses are because you tell everybody. It's the truth. I'm not even the devil. Give me 24 hours and access to your social media and I can tell you what all your problems are. Because you spill your guts to everybody. 
when wise people should watch their words because the Bible says one day we'll give an account for every idle word. I mean, you follow people on Facebook and they'll say, well, you know that my greatest weakness, always had trouble with men, always have, always will. I'm just attracted to men that are destructive. I can't help it. My mom was that way. My grandma was that way. We just always fall in love with men that destroy our lives. It's just my rotten life. And they don't even bother to clean up their pictures. They've got pictures of all of their relationships. That's Bob. That's Frank. That's Tommy. Billy was a bum, but he had a good heart. The devil doesn't need the gifts of the Holy Ghost to know your weaknesses. We talk too much. We talk too much. And the power of life and death is in the tongue. And since there was no moral flaw, don't miss this. Morally, Paul was impeccable. Since there was no moral flaw in Paul that Satan could use against him, it seems pretty clear that Satan had sent a messenger a person, an assassin, a spiritual assassin, to torment him and to try to impede the progress of what God was going to do in his life. Actually, the word thorn in the Greek is a Greek word, skylops. And we think oftentimes a thorn in the flesh and we think about thorns on a rose bush. It actually would be better defined as a stake the devil wanted Paul's head on a stake. And we oftentimes think of a little thorn that just is kind of bothering him and, you know, burr under his saddle. Satan wanted Paul's head on a stake. Satan wants your head on a stake. Number three, what was the purpose of Paul's thorn in the flesh? Paul told us that too, twice. 2 Corinthians 12 and 7, to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan, to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Many scholars seem to take Paul literally that Paul was admitting that one of his weaknesses prior to conversion that he had to keep under the blood after conversion was he was prone to pride. And knowing his credentials, it's easy to understand why. He said to keep me from becoming proud. One version said, lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul had encountered Jesus supernaturally on the road to Damascus, had been called by Jesus personally. Jesus called him his chosen instrument. Jesus said Paul was called. He was called by God to take the gospel to the Gentiles, kings, and to God's chosen people. Paul's ambassadorship was on a high level of appointment. Look at Acts chapter 9 if you have your Bible. Acts chapter 9 verses 15 and 16. But the Lord said, go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul, so committed, so consecrated, such a man of prayer, such a man of moral conscience and walking in holiness, the Bible said that signs and wonders and miracles followed him wherever he went. You have to understand, don't miss this, that when heaven lifts you up into a high place of leadership, hell will automatically lift you up in a high place of assassination. That's why many mighty ministries fall. Somewhere along the way, they take off a couple of layers of their 
humility. Somewhere along the way, they've prayed so much, they feel like I don't have to pray quite so much. God knows my heart. Somewhere along the way, they've got so much of the Bible in their mind and in their life notes and in their library that they no longer open their Bible and study it to where tears fall on its pages. And if you're not careful, the ministry can go from the living waters of a man's belly into the carnality of his intellect and his mind. And people can minister from intellectual prowess. And most people in the church are wowed by it and never see that the fire went out a long time ago. I often pray, Lord, I'll never ask you that my fire would be large. But I beg of you, always let my fire be real. You just have to be what God's called you to be. And you can't pretend to be anybody else. You know, when the Lord called me to sing when I was younger, I thought he had made a foolish mistake. Because I was learning to play the guitar when I went to Bible college. And I've always loved music. But I've never had lessons. Everything that I have, whatever that might be, is God-taught, self-taught, hard work, practice. But I decided, you know what, I'm going to take a step of faith and I'm going to try out for the choir. I tried out for the choir and I remember my audition. The professor of the music department pulled me aside privately and said, Tiff, you know, some people just aren't meant to sing. That's what he told me. Some people just aren't meant to sing. And he was probably right because I remember being so scared. I remember going into the audition with my heart pounding out of my chest. My knees were shaking so bad I didn't think I could stand up and think, what in the world have I done? I couldn't stand in front of people. Believe it or not, I used to be very bashful. And if you knew me outside the platform, I still prefer solitude, peace and quiet, and uh, don't get much of that. But that's kind of my element. That's why my wife texted me the other day here in Alaska. She said, you're in your element, aren't you? because she knows how much I love the wilderness. She knows how much I love the scenic things that God has created. I always taught my kids when they were little, if you want to know a lot about men, study the city. Men made the city. But if you want to know a lot about God, study the country and the wilderness and the mountains and the lakes and the streams and wildlife. God made that. And that's my nature. But I can tell you this, that was like a brand. Some people should just never sing. And so I kept trying to play to learn to play the guitar. But after he told me that, I always went up in the attic of the dormitory and hid. And I'd sit up there and try to learn how to play guitar. I was embarrassed. Occasionally, because I loved the Lord, I would sing. And I'll never forget when the Lord spoke to my heart and said, I didn't teach you how to play the guitar, just to play the guitar. It'll be a part of your ministry. And you don't know how many years that I sang that I wrestled and struggled and was scared to death and would forget lyrics and just couldn't hardly do it. Do you know what helped me? I was with a a man who's in the Gospel Music Hall of Fame when I was just starting out in ministry. His name was Big John Hall. And he was a friend of our family's. And uh, he had asked me to travel with him on a particular tour and to drive him around, help him out. And we were driving to a church. And I said, Big John, can I ask you a question? Because I knew he had sung in front of Massive crowds and, and uh, credible voice. I said, how do you ever get over that fear? Do you, do you ever have any fear? He said, no. He said, uh, I really don't. I, don't. I don't have any fear. He said, Tiff, let me give you a word of advice. Whenever you get up to sing, nobody's expecting to hear Kenny Rogers or Elvis Presley or Big John Hall 
or any famous quartet, when you're introduced and you get up to sing, they're only li listening to you. And all you ever can be is what God created you to be. So I figured out pretty quick, I'm a country boy. And that's why I haven't done any of Snoop Dogg's music since I've been here. <laughs> there was a time in my life when I almost did a unique album where I wrote the music. It was half country and half rap. And uh, I was going to call it crap. And... Uh, Lord, I apologize for that. I ask you to forgive me and help me to move on. But you know, like the Apostle Paul, <laughs> I actually said that out loud, didn't I? I'm trying to help you with something that's practical, and maybe that was a little too practical. <laughs> but you can only be who God created you to be. And so I'm country, and whenever I get up to sing, you're either going to hear country or you're going to hear blues, but you're never going to hear rap. <laughs> now, people are gifted in that. I marvel at some of their, I mean, somebody like Kanye West and, you know, some of these people, they're, they're just brilliant, incredibly gifted people. But that's not me. And like the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul didn't try to be anybody else but Paul, and Paul was a big dog. And he wrestled with his pride. He said it. I close with these two points. Number four, what Paul's thorn in the flesh was not. Now, if you study and listen to people, sooner or later you're going to hear all kinds of unlettered ministers give their asserted opinions as to what Paul's thorn in the flesh was with no Bible to back it. And what you'll often hear, which is probably the most common assertion, is that Paul's thorn in the flesh was chronic eye disease. But there's nothing in the Bible to support that. Paul never said he had eye disease. But they take a passage where Paul said, you've seen with what large letters I write, and say, well, he was getting old and his eyes were going bad, and that was his thorn in the flesh. Paul didn't say that. Paul wrote those letters from prisons. Prisons were most of the time, in the major cities where he was in prison, were right in the sewage system under the cities. And they were dark and dank and disease-ridden. And he probably had to write with large letters for other reasons. We don't know. We can't be dogmatic about it. But you certainly can't build doctrine that he had chronic eye disease. But you'd be amazed how many notable ministries will get to this passage and launch off on this speculative text that Paul had eye disease. And I've heard people speculate that he had speech disability. I've heard people say he had malaria, migraines, had carnal temptations in his flesh, epilepsy. I heard one preacher say, I really in my heart feel like God revealed to me it was a club foot. <laughs> Where in the world do these morons... I, I, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> Where do these unlettered ministers come up with such speculation? I even heard one guy said the Lord revealed to him Paul had a hunchback. Heard another preacher say, I'm sure it was his wife. <laughs> Paul was in the Sanhedrin. He had to be married. He had to be married to be in the Sanhedrin. His wife didn't travel with him. His thorn in the flesh was his wife. Well, there's a beautiful thing to teach your people. Some people think it was a man by the name of Alexander. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, but the Lord will judge him for what he has done. Be careful of him, 
for he fought against everything we said. And so there are many scholars who say Paul's thorn in the flesh he identified in his second letter to his protege Timothy and said it was Alexander the coppersmith. But at least these people have their foot in the Bible. At least they have Bible to stand upon, although Paul never referred specifically to Alexander as his thorn in the flesh. There are parallels. He fought against everything I did, everything I said. So at least there's the possibility there, but once again, you cannot be absolute and dogmatic about it, but at least there's a foot in the Bible on that. But I'll tell you what, there is nothing in any New Testament scripture to support any speculation about any kind of disease. Zero. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Each time, he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses, in the insults, hardships, persecutions, troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, I then am strong. Paul not one single time comes anywhere close to giving us an identity or a bridge to sickness or infirmity. Romans chapter 8 verse 26, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit also helps our infirmities. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Lastly, what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Number four, what Paul's thorn in the flesh was not. Lastly, number five, what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Paul's words made it clear. His thorn in the flesh was a real and persistent attack against his life, his ministry, and his teaching. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger. Now remember, messenger from the original Greek, angelos, is always interpreted as an angel or a messenger set on an assignment being that he identified whatever this person was, was sent from Satan. One translation uses the word assassin. But Paul said to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Anybody that's ever pastored for more than three months will have somebody in their church that wasn't sent from God they were sent from the devil to torment the pastor. Thank you for all those amens. I was a preacher's kid before I was an evangelist. And I tell pastors, you have to be very discerning. Because sometimes people that come into your church weren't sent from God. They were sent from the devil. And they'll come parading into a house of God and put their talent on display or their wisdom on display or give you their resume of ministry talent and skill sets or tell you about how much money they have and how they can help you. And, but anybody in ministry walks in a discernment of the Holy Ghost. That's why the Bible says don't lay hands on people suddenly. When I grew up, whether he ever announced it publicly, I don't know. But my dad and mom, as a pastor and a pastor's wife, they had a policy. When you came to the church, you sat for one year before my dad would ever allow you to do anything. Because he wanted to see what your spirit was. He wanted to see if you had gifts, if you were humble enough to sit on it. Because the Bible says when you enter a room, take the lesser seat until you're called to the better seat. And he wanted to see if people had enough grace and Christ-likeness and patience to sit in a lesser seat. 
because he knew that if they didn't have patience for a lesser seat, they would never have holiness in a greater seat. Tweet the bananas out of that. If you don't have patience for the lesser seat, you'll never have the holiness for the greater seat. Wait until you're called. Quit trying to put yourself out there. Number one reason you come to the house of God should be to receive from the word of God and to worship the king. Amen. To support whatever the vision is that God has raised up. Not to assert yourself into the mix. Can I hear a good amen? amen. That's why I'm an evangelist. You can throw me out after just a couple of messages like this. Did Paul say that this messenger of Satan was sent to make him sick? Never. He said it was sent to torment. One translation says, buffet him, which means to strike repeatedly. That's what they said about Jesus when he was on trial at his crucifixion. I believe in Matthew 26, that he was buffeted. They buffeted him, repeated blows. Every single time this word is used in the New Testament, it is always used of people, never sickness. Never one time in the entirety of the Bible is the word buffet ever used with sickness, always people. Just for your life notes, let me give you three Old Testament references to read in your own time. The first one is in Numbers chapter 33 and verse 35, uh, 55. And the second is in Joshua chapter 23 and verse 13. And then in the book of Judges chapter 2 and verse 3. Let me give you those three Old Testament passages to study on your own. But you know what you're going to find is the commonality in all of those three passages? You're going to find phrases depending upon your translation. Thorns in your sides, thorns in your eyes, thorns in the flesh, pricks in the flesh, do you know what they all have in common? They always referred to people who were attacking the people of God. The Philistines were called thorns in their sides. So I hope I've made this clear tonight. It is absolutely a violation of the Bible to ever. It is, listen, it is never, never in any application acceptable to call Paul's thorn in the flesh a sickness or a disease or an infirmity. One of the great scholars still alive on this planet, his name is Dr. John MacArthur, and uh, there might be some small secondary issues in doctrine that he may not agree with me on, but even in the subject of healing, I oftentimes read intelligent people, whether they're in complete agreement with my view or biblical view or, you know, I want to be teachable all the days of my life. And if there's something missing, I need to study people who have a different view. I told somebody at the Bible college the other day that was upset over a certain issue, I said, you need to chill out. Intelligent people welcome healthy debate. They don't attack brothers and sisters because of some minor disagreement and get all bent in the flesh about stuff. Intelligent people should be able to sit at a table of fellowship as brothers and sisters in Christ and discuss Scripture. And if there's a disagreement, then there should be a passion to find out what's true. The goal is not to be right the goal is to be accurate. Did you hear what I said? When it comes to reading the Word of God, the goal is not for you to be right. It is for you to have an accurate understanding as to what the original author meant. Not what you want your mother-in-law to believe. And people fail in doctrine because they can't keep their bias and their personal fingerprints off of what they want the Bible to say. You have to back up and lay aside all preconceived ideas, all preconceived biases, 
and humbly say, Heavenly Father, what did the original author say and what did the original author mean? And I have great respect for some theologians that are alive today and I pulled out my set of MacArthur commentaries and pretty much word for word, everything that I've preached tonight, he laid out from the original text. And though we may have some variances on some things in divine healing, there's no variance in this scholarship. A thorn in the flesh throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New, always referred to a person who was opposing the work of God. And in every church, there are some thorns in the flesh sitting in the pews that need to get to an altar of repentance and say, Lord, deliver me from my desire to assert my view, my gift, my talent, my ambition, and get to an altar and say, Lord, may I always be a humble servant who only desires to further the work of God, further the vision, and further what the Scripture has to say, and keep my fingerprints washed in the blood off of everything holy that you're doing. May I stand and never have an aspiration than to be at the foot of the cross. If you believe and receive the word of the Lord, give God a mighty hand of praise. Praise the Lord. I told you that I would be finished each night at 9. I've finished a little early tonight, but I've said what needed to be said and covered what I need to cover. I made that executive decision prior to coming to church that I was going to just pull out what I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted to clarify. Now here's where this comes into practicality. This eliminates every passage in the New Testament. Listen carefully. A proper understanding of Paul's thorn in the flesh eliminates every passage in the New Testament where people can try to build a doctrine that sometimes God wants us well and sometimes God wants us sick completely annihilates that. I've said it I don't know how many thousands of times through the years. I say it again tonight. May the Holy Spirit brand it deep in your spirit. Just as every sinner has the divine right to call upon God for the forgiveness of their sins, every believer has the divine right to call upon God for their health and their healing in time of physical attack. If you've listened carefully tonight, I'll tell you a prayer that should never again come from your mouth. And for many of you, you've prayed it many times because you've heard other Christians pray. But if you learn the word of the Lord tonight, a prayer has been deleted from your spirit that will never again be uttered. Do you know what that prayer is? Lord, if it be your will, would you please help me and heal me? You can't ever pray that. Even the leper that came to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you want to, you can make me well. The leper had faith to believe that Jesus could heal, but he didn't have it settled that Jesus could heal him and that's where a lot of people are and wrestle in the doctrine of healing it's not that they don't believe that Jesus can heal they struggle to make it personal that Jesus can heal me do you know what Jesus did with that leper before he healed him he corrected his theology what do you mean if I want to I want to be thou healed. Before he said, be thou healed, he corrected his theology. What do you mean, if I want to? God wants to save you. God wants to deliver you. God wants to heal you.
God wants to help you with your health. Last time I read the Bible, he said, with long life, I will satisfy thee. You've got to quit saying stuff that violates the covenant of God. Because the power of life and death is in the tongue. You've got to, got to quit saying stuff like cancer runs in our family. You've got to quit saying stuff like heart disease runs in our family. You gotta quit saying stuff like everybody on my daddy's side gets dementia. You gotta quit saying, you know, so and so, my uncle didn't make it to his 50th birthday. His brother didn't make it to his 53rd birthday. I'm 56. I've only got days or hours left. You gotta quit saying stuff that violates what the Bible said. Regardless of how you feel, you need to begin to talk like Jesus talked. You need to start saying stuff like Paul said. You need to take the word of God and eliminate every other statement and say, Father, I may not understand what I'm going through, but I know who my Savior is. I know who my healer is. I know who my helper is. I know who my provider is. I know who my miracle worker is. I know who my deliverer is. Is, and my faith is in the Lord. Hallelujah. Pardon me for getting excited, but I'm not selling vacuum cleaners. I wrestled with the death angel not long ago who met me on a back road where I didn't even have phone signal. Knew I wouldn't have phone signal for hours. Knew I wouldn't be near a hospital or a doctor or any help. And for seven hours in the wilderness of nowhere, I fought for my life. You know what came out of my mouth? The Word of God. Once I realized that this was more than just a pain, that my body was under an attack like I had never felt before. And I even lost the ability to talk because I lost the ability to breathe. But I was whispering things like, Father, I thank you that you said with long life you'll satisfy me. I don't know what's going on in my body right now, but you've always been my great physician. And you heal real sickness. And you heal real disease. And you deliver us from our afflictions. You said in Psalm 34, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. Father, I thank you that I can't die out here in the middle of nowhere because you said in the Bible, in the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother that your days might be long on the earth. And you know of all the brothers, I've probably honored my mom and dad more than anybody. I love them. I serve them. I relocated my family and my ministry to help my dad in his last church. A year after I moved there, he had a stroke. I was there to honor him, to help him. Father, I thank you. Those that honor their father and mother will live long lives on the earth. Father, I thank you that the Bible says, even in our old age, our leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever we do is shall prosper. Not one negative thing came out of my mouth. Not one question came out of my mouth. Not one why came out of my mouth and the moment I could get my hands on my Bible I opened it to Isaiah 53 my pastor waiting in the driveway for me took me to the hospital before I got in his truck I said pastor grab my Bible and I had to whisper it in his ear where is it Tiff it's in my backpack in the front seat Get my Bible. I'm not leaving without my Bible. The Bible I hold in my hand. When they took me into ICU, I had my Bible. I opened it to Isaiah 53. I laid it on my lungs and I began to thank God. You were wounded for my transgressions. You were bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon you and by your stripes I am healed. I spoke to the devil. I said, devil, you can't have me you can't take me you can't even have an hour of my life you can't have a minute of my life I belong to the most high and I am coming through in Jesus name you got to get your mouth in agreement with the Bible quit talking about all your pains and ills and sufferings and trials and how hard it is 
get that stuff out of your spirit. If you want to win battles, you got to start talking like a warrior. The power of God that saved you is the same power of God that can heal you. If you believe and receive, listen carefully. If you believe and receive the word of God for your own health, for your own life, for your own family, for your own lifespan, give a mighty cry of amen to Almighty God in heaven right now. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. I want to pray with you before we go. Some time ago, I felt the Lord speak to my heart and said, don't just pray for the sick anymore. Pray a holy hedge of protection around the well. If you'll start praying that way, there'll be less people in your meetings that need prayer for their sickness. It's kind of like the difference between giving a man a fish and teaching a man to fish. On the spiritual side of things. Because I've learned, by God's grace, how to live in a holy hedge of protection around my body. Have I been attacked? Of course I have. But in 43 years, preaching probably on average of about 300 times a year in 56 countries of the world, I've never missed one single service because of sickness, disease, suffering, throat trouble, laryngitis. It's almost like God has kept a holy hedge of protection around me any time I've ever had a battle. The attack of the enemy was never allowed to touch me when I was in meetings. When I'm operating in my gift, when I'm walking as an ambassador for the king, when I'm walking under the anointing of my calling, I have found that there's a holy hedge that nothing can touch me. I was headed to the remote jungles of India to preach a crusade many years ago. Booked a train ticket. Got to the destination after doing a crusade with about 13 to 15,000 people a night. Now headed to the remote jungles of India to reach unreached people. They picked me up, handed me my ticket. I looked at my ticket, which was supposed to be for the next night, Saturday night. And it was written in Telugu. I don't read Telugu. But at the very bottom, in really little print, I saw FRI. I said, brother, are you sure this ticket's for tomorrow night? Oh, yes, brother, we bought the ticket for you. It's all set tomorrow night. You travel on the train. I said, well, just take a look, because in America, FRI means Friday. And I don't read your language. Oh, brother, we must go now. And I mean, we had to fly there. Long story short, when I got back from that week of meetings in the remote jungle, 12-hour train ride. And when I say train, there were about 100 people in my car, and it said seats 42. We literally were sitting on board, a board, board on one side, board on the other. They had run wildlife, cattle, or I don't know what the smell was, but there had been animals before they had transported us and shoulder to shoulder for 12 hours on a plank. A couple of military guys, one guy's gun kept bumping me in the head and I finally took the barrel and uh, gave him that loving look <laughs> to let him know I was tired of that. When I finally got back from that week of meetings, the same pastor that took me to the train station met me with the paper. Front page, front headlines. The train that I was scheduled to be on Saturday derailed, went into the river, and 186 people were killed. The Lord kept me off that train. And I could tell you story after story. I say all of that to say this. I'm going to pray and ask God to surround you with a holy hedge of protection. I want that to get into your spirit that you just don't go to God when you're sick. You learn how to keep the shield of faith always up because you're in a battle. And most of the time when we suffer loss, it's because we forget that we're in war and we
we let the shield of faith down and we take our hand off the sword of the spirit and we get carnal because we live in a carnal world and we forget that the enemy like a roaring lion walks about he's waiting for you to be vulnerable he's waiting for you to be lonely he's waiting for you to go through hell sideways he's waiting for a bad patch in your marriage he's waiting like a roaring lion and most of the time when we get in trouble it's because subconsciously we just get weary and we lower the shield of faith that quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You can't stop the fiery darts of the wicked one. The shield of faith does. So we're going to pray and ask the Lord by the anointing of the Holy Spirit to surround every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. Let me tell every parent something. You can raise your children in an ungodly, wicked world where they can walk in the holiness and peace and protection of God where no weapon formed against your kids can prosper. Can I hear a good amen? Before I pray for you and we head our separate ways, I never preach the gospel without giving people an opportunity to make peace with God. Number one question that comes in, people ask, it's phrased differently, but it all comes down to the same thing. Tiff, Tell me how I can have right relationship with God. Tell me how I can have peace with God like you have. How can all my sins be forgiven? How can all my past be forgotten? Will God forgive me? Does God love me? Have I gone too far? Have I committed the unpardonable sin? All comes back to one thing. People want to know, how do you get right with God? So every person within the sound of my voice present here tonight, those of you watching online, to make peace with God, not according to me, not according to denominational creed, but according to the Bible, according to Jesus. Number one, you have to admit your sin. It's as simple as ABC. A, admit your sin. There has to be a time in your life when you own up. You have to come to God in humility and say, God, I know I've sinned. I know I've broken commandments. I know I've done stuff that's grieved your heart. B, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. Not believe he existed, believe he loved you. Believe he died on the cross, believe he was the son of God, believe that he rose again, believe he's coming soon. In childlike faith, you have to believe that Jesus Christ alone saves, forgives, heals, restores. See, you have to make a commitment to God personally and publicly, just like a man and a woman who are in love. The man proposes, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I consecrate my life to you. Well, he's got to do more than say that. He has to stand at an altar sooner or later and say it before God, family, and friends. And he has to make a vow. And if he's stringing you out for years telling you that, lady, God didn't create you to be his lonely pill. Tell him to man up and do what's right or send him packing. God has something better for you. A real man will not drag you along. He'll figure out that there's commitment to true love. And he'll man up and he'll say with a smile on his face, till death do us part. That's what you got to do with Jesus. Salvation's like that. You have to come before God like we're going to do at this altar in just a moment. Say, God, you know I've sinned. But tonight I believe in you in childlike faith. I don't understand it all, but I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, soon coming King, my Lord and Savior. And tonight in childlike faith, I commit my heart to Him. I want you to stand to your feet across this sanctuary. Some of you that will pray with me, it will be the very first time you've ever prayed a prayer like this personally and publicly. But there are others of you that if you'd be honest with God, you might be backslidden away from the Lord. Let me put it to you in straight Alaska English. You're not living in victory over sin. Sin is living in victory over you. And you need to come home. And you can come home. 
not here to judge you or condemn you. I'm your best friend. I'm here to help you. I want to pray with you. But you're going to have to make a real decision. It's going to take a real man. It's going to take a real woman. So don't be looking to somebody on your left or right to tell you what to do. Somebody will walk with you, but you have to make the decision personally. Christian, you know what I'm going to ask you to do, as I do in every service? If there's someone with you, friend, family, loved one, son, daughter, husband, wife, neighbor, maybe a visitor that you've never seen before. As people are gathering, if you're not sure that person's made their own personal and public commitment, I want you to just lovingly and kindly turn to them and say as they begin to sing this song of worship and invitation. And all you have to do is say, if you'd like to pray, I'll walk with you. And sometimes that's the only encouragement somebody needs. And I'm going to kneel here and pray that God will give you the courage and the faith and the humility to do what you need to do. Those of you that are watching online, I want you to be patient because some of you need to get right with God. And when you pray with me, don't just shut the video off or the podcast off. However you're listening to this, when you're done praying with me, if you really meant business with God, if you live here in Alaska, I want you to go to KC Alaska and on their website, let them know that you made a commitment to Christ tonight and they'll follow up on you. If you're anywhere else in the world, I want you to go to our website, lostlamb.org and click on new beginnings and just follow the very easy prompts. And I want to follow up on you. Everybody's somebody to Jesus. And whoever you are, I've dedicated my entire life to helping people just like you. I want you to email me and let me know. And I want to help you. We'll continue to pray with you. Make sure you get a Bible and so on. But if God's speaking to your heart, wherever you might be, as they lead us in a song of invitation, just come and stand here, kneel here, whatever you're able to do. Listen, if you're elderly, dear friend of mine here in Alaska just had surgery on some joints there was some time when he wouldn't have been able to kneel for any amount of money so if you're elderly or you've had some type of issue or a war wound or shrapnel just come and sit in one of the front seats if you want they'll make room for you and we're gonna pray a simple prayer together I'm not gonna keep you I'm not gonna embarrass you we're gonna make things right with God through the power of consecrated prayer and tonight is a night that'll change the very destiny of your life if you mean business with God. If you feel that loving tug of the Holy Spirit, you come right now and then we'll pray. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are Those of you that are watching online, wherever you might be, you're not talking to me. The only reason I lead you in this prayer is I have met countless thousands of people who have said something like this, I don't even know how to pray, or I don't know what to pray, or how do you pray? That's why Jesus taught the disciples when they said, how do we pray? He said, pray like this, our Father which art, and he gave them a model prayer. But you're talking to God. And the Bible says all who call upon his name shall be saved. He's listening to your prayer. Pray this with me right now. Say, Heavenly Father. Tonight as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. You're holy. And by nature I'm not. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short 
of your holiness and your glory. I admit my sin. And in childlike faith, I turn my heart to Jesus Christ. I repent of my sin. I turn my back on sin. And I turn my heart to Jesus. I trust in the cross. And in the blood that was shed, wash me and make me holy in your eyes. Purify my mind, my body, and my spirit. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Tonight I receive salvation as the gift of God and by your great grace. Tonight I'm saved. I'm healed, I'm delivered, I'm set free. I am no longer the property of sin. I am tonight a child of God and I'll never be the same. In place of my weakness, fill me with the Holy Spirit. I vow I will serve you in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. I know this is going to be crowded, and this isn't going to take long. I think sometimes churches have been misguided in thinking that if we pray longer and harder and louder and shout and hit 104 decibels, that somehow that hastens the work of God. The Bible tells me the woman with the issue of blood simply reached out and touched the hem of his garment and was instantly made whole. The miracle power, I can tell you after 43 years of praying for the sick and miracles, the miracle power is in the touching and the token of faith where your faith touches and accepts and receives what can only be obtained in the presence of the Lord. And so I know it's going to be crowded, but I want every single person that wants that holy hedge of protection in your health, your children, your grandchildren, by faith, to just make your way to the altar. If you're at the altar, get as close as you possibly can, because it's a big crowd tonight, and I know it's going to be crowded. Just remember you're among people that love you. Come thanking God for healing. Come giving Jesus praise for the stripes upon his back. Come thanking the Savior for the blood that was shed. Wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes I am healed. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, Psalm 34, 11, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If there's any room between you and the altar, even if it's six inches, squeeze in. We've still got some people in the aisles. Man, I sure love you folks here in Wasilla. You know, I do this sometimes in churches and a third of the people come, two-thirds fold their arms and look at you. I love a house that's been taught how to trust in God, believe His Word is true. Now, I know it's tight, so when you raise your hand, be careful you don't poke somebody in the eye so I don't have to pray for unnecessary things. But carefully and slowly, raise a hand to the Most High. And you pray and exercise your faith, but I'm going to pray and release the healing power of God. And then I'm asking God for a holy hedge of protection. It's not visible, but I know it's real because I've lived in it before I recognized what it was. But I know at 63 what it is. And what God will do for one man, he'll do for any man. What God will do for one woman, he'll do for any woman. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, 
the integrity of the Bible said you would above all things that we would prosper and be in health and be in health be in wholeness be in completeness even as our soul prospers and you said if we ask for anything that is in agreement with your will we can have whatsoever we ask we don't have to plead we don't have to beg we only have to believe and agree and speak we believe you're the healer we believe you're the great physician we believe you're a miracle worker you said signs wonders and miracles would follow the preaching of your word so in jesus mighty name you said those that preach the gospel heal the sick i am acting and praying in direct obedience to the commandment of god i release the fire of god that heals i release the fire of god that heals from the top of every head to the sole of every foot to the tip of every finger i command every cancer every tumor every unnatural growth within the sound of my voice shrivel up and die and be removed from their bodies i release the recreative miracles of god to heal eyes to heal glaucoma to heal cataracts to heal macular degeneration to hear loss of sight loss of hearing deaf ears come open recreate a miracle let new eardrums be formed in ears as we pray and tonight as they sleep and tonight as they rest the fire of god move through their bodies and make them every wit whole i speak to heart disease in the name of jesus and command the curse to be reversed heal hearts clear out arteries remove blockages everything that hinders health and life and strength you said as our days are so shall our strength be you said the same spirit that raised christ from the dead quickens our mortal bodies i release the quickening power of god heal our mortal bodies heal our mortal bodies when you heal the leper you showed the world that you had power over all skin diseases i command every skin disease within the sound of my voice be healed eczema go psoriasis go wounds that won't heal heal in the name of jesus in the mighty name of Jesus I pray that you'd restore blood pressure to normal levels I pray in Jesus mighty name that you'd begin to perform that which only God can do that people will have to raise their hands in services in the days ahead and say pastor Bracken I have to share a mighty miracle I have to share a healing that God did for me and that people would begin to walk from unbelief into belief i pray that you would give them the ability to say even as thomas said lord i believe help thou my unbelief take this church to a new level of miracles i pray that there would be a supernatural monumental move of the spirit that accompanies them into that new church on the very day their feet tread upon the sanctuary and pastor stands at the platform let the wind of the holy ghost blow a fresh wind into the vision and take them to places they have never been before let the fire of god become hotter let the presence of god become more powerful let signs and wonders and miracles become more real may it be known around this valley and around this state 
that there is a miracle working church in Wasilla, Alaska where the fire of God has lit a fire for all of the Alaskan people to come and enjoy. May the flow of the Holy Spirit be unhindered. May all who walk in the house be covered in holiness with a passion to serve you under the coming of the Lord. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit you draw the lost. Family after family after family add to the church daily such as should be saved. Give these people their households, all their sons, all their daughters, all their grandchildren, all their nieces, all their nephews, all their brothers, all their sisters, all their mothers, all their fathers, all their uncles, all their aunts. In the mighty name of Jesus, let salvation flow like a mighty waterfall. One more time, lift a hand to God. Now, Father, I now ask that a holy hedge of protection now surround them surround them that they'll learn how to identify it to know it to walk in it and I release angels for the Bible said in the book of Hebrews concerning angels are they not all ministering spirits who are sent forth for the heirs of salvation I release mighty angels on their behalf because they are heirs of salvation may there be angelic presence that watches over their holy hedge guard them from the rear guard them from the front guard them from the top guard them from the bottom guard them from the sides let a holy hedge of divine protection surround them i pray for their daughters surround the daughters of this church that are innocent and pure surround them with angels no weapon of sin or Satan can touch them. Surround their boys with holiness and righteousness and a spirit to be warriors for the most time. Surround their boys in angelic presence. May they walk in the power and the fear of God all the days of their life. Raise our children up to be mighty warriors of God. Not normal, abnormal warriors for God. Special forces for God in the mighty name of Jesus the angels of heaven come with us and go with us as we carry out the covenant of the most high and I proclaim this now in the name of the father in the name of the son and in the name of the Holy Ghost may it be so even as we have declared according to the word of God so be it in the name of Jesus and shall I receive it in the name of Jesus. I receive it in the name of Jesus. Now let the words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart never violate it. Never again say heart disease runs in my family cancer runs in my family diabetes runs in my family I don't care if it does run in your family run it out of your family last I checked when you got saved God adopted you in his family and I can guarantee you that it doesn't run in Jesus family under the blood I'm covered healed whole delivered the curse of sin, the curse of sickness, the curse of lack will never touch my home. And no plague shall come nigh, not only me, but my dwelling. Your pets get healed in Jesus' name. Just walking around your house in the presence of God. Say, how old is that dog? 27? Let abnormal testimonies back every word from the Bible and all God's people said if you prayed to receive Christ won't you let us know we'd love to help you grow in the things of God text us at 907-357-2065 you can see the number on your screen and text saved and we'll help you grow in the things of God God bless you and remember God's on the throne and the devil's been defeated peace